Welcome back. Okay, we've been talking about hypothesis testing, which is a really central idea in statistics about making statistical statements about your data, what distributions it comes from, has something changed in your data, things like that. And one of the key ideas is this notion of a p-value or a significance value of that hypothesis test. So generally speaking, we want small p-values of 0.05 for statistically significant or 0.01 for strong statistical significance, which roughly corresponds to having like a 95% confidence or a 99% confidence that your hypothesis is true. And the emphasis on this p-value has created a lot of incentive for people and researchers to do something called p-hacking. Now, there's a lot of subtle terminology here, and I'm not going to um, perfectly, you know, capture all of the nuances of all of the ways you would say this. Um, I'm going to use kind of a big umbrella and say everything I'm going to describe is a form of p-hacking. Sometimes people do p-hacking uh, on accident, that's quite common. Sometimes people do it maliciously or fraudulently. Sometimes it's a combination of both. And if you want to be a really ethical, honest, good scientist, you have to be super aware of these pitfalls and what can go wrong. So roughly speaking, p-hacking is a bad way of doing statistics where you only report experiments that yield significant p-values while ignoring or omitting non-significant results. In all of the cases we've done so far, in all of the examples, there has been one simple hypothesis, and it was pretty obvious how to test that hypothesis. There was one test, one hypothesis. But lots of times, if you collect a complex data set with lots of dependent variables and lots of outcomes, maybe you're doing a longitudinal health study and you measure a lot of factors that could affect someone's health and you measure a lot of health outcomes, you could do tons of different comparisons. And if you do enough hypothesis tests, even just by chance, maybe one of them will have a significant p-value, even if none of them are actually true, even if there's no significance uh, in that study. So remember, the p-value gives you your rate of, um, I guess, false positives. So how often you would reject the null hypothesis, even if the null hypothesis was true. And if I run, you know, hundreds of hypotheses, hypotheses and test them, I'll just by chance get some of them that have a significant p-value. That's what p-hacking is. So I'm going to give you some examples um, of the most common ones, and then we're going to fire up some Python code and actually go through an example of one of my favorite um, kind of examples of p-hacking that's related to some of our earlier examples. So very, very quickly, um, kind of some of the most obvious ones are... Uh, what's known as cherry picking, um, cherry picking or multiple comparisons. Um, and it's essentially what I was describing, um, describing before. Maybe you have a data set and you run a bunch of hypotheses. You hypothesize that the mean increases. You hypothesize that the mean decreases. You hypothesize that the standard deviation changes. You run just a bunch of hypotheses on your data. Um, and if you wait until one of them has a significant p-value and you only publish that result, but you don't tell people that you ran five or 10 tests, that's cheating, that's p-hacking, you can't do that. Um, another really, really common one, kind of related, is this notion, uh, it's called data dredging or phishing. Um, data dredging, sometimes called phishing, going on a data phishing expedition. And essentially, this is the most common in the big data era, um, in the big data era, where nowadays we collect these massive, massive data sets where there might be like hundreds or thousands of variables. And if I do every point-to-point -point comparison of all of those variables, I'm going to find spurious correlations. I'm going to find things that are correlated in my data that have a significant, very significant p-value, even if realistically those correlations are totally bogus. Just by random chance, again, the p-value says that some of the time you're going to get these false positives, meaning false spurious correlations. So big data, spurious correlations, huge um, 
thing to look out for. And the way you correct for both of these, there are corrections you do for the numbers of tests that you run. If I run a hundred tests, I have to adjust my p-value. Um, I have to normalize my p-value if I run multiple tests or multiple correlations. Proper statisticians know how to do this, but this is one of the most common pitfalls. And then the one that I'm going to show you today um, in, in Python code is kind of a neat one. When you're designing a test, let's say you're trying to test um, in our website example where we, you know, we had a website with an average number of daily visits, and then we did a you know, marketing campaign to try to increase the daily visits. We wanted to hypothesis test, did the mean value, did the average daily visitors increase? We averaged over 30 days. We did a sample of 30 days and averaged over those 30 days, n equaled 30, um, and then we did a hypothesis based on that data. If you stop your data collection, if, if, I, if I started at 20 days and then I calculated my p-value and then I went another day and calculated my p-value and then I went another day and calculated my p-value and I did that for 20 more days, I could probably find one day where my p-value dipped below significance even if uh, overall, my data, my, my results were not significant. And so this idea of um, kind of stopping your data collection, this is actually a really pernicious one, stopping data collection. So it's very, very natural. Um, I feel like, you know, anyone who's run experiments has thought about doing this. Every day you check on your experiment, you check on your experiment, you check on your experiment, and you're kind of waiting for it to look good, you know, to, to look significant. And then if you stopped right there, that's cheating. Okay, you have to specify uh, how long, how many samples you're going to collect ahead of time. You have to specify n ahead of time. Um, this is a really, really pernicious one, and this is one that we're going to actually code up in Python. Good. This is just some of the examples. There are like whole studies on p-hacking, how to avoid it, how, what to look out for. Um, here at UW, Jevin West and Carl Bergstrom are experts on, you know, they, they wrote a book called Calling Bullshit. It's great. Um, and they teach a class that essentially talks about these kinds of pitfalls that you can look for. If you're looking at someone's data and what they're trying to convince you of, these are common pitfalls um, of, or ways of manipulating statistics so that they can say what they want uh, and fool you. Okay, so sometimes this is fraudulence, sometimes this is ignorance, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Let's code up an example and, and look at these, okay? So um, there's actually kind of a cute website um, called like Spurious Correlation, something like that. Let me find it. Um, yeah, if you just Google spurious correlations, you'll find um, you'll find this website. It's pretty cool. It just has a huge amount of data um, over time. So from 2004 to 2022, so some number of years, they they measure a bunch of, of data. OK, like I think hundreds or maybe thousands of independent things they measure over this time period and they can compute the correlations from every single uh, between every single thing that they're measuring. And because they have such a large number of, of variables that they're comparing, they find a lot of bogus spurious correlations. So this website is kind of, um, its, its purpose, I guess, is to try to educate people about spurious correlations and this data dredging phishing issue. So, um, you know, popularity of the first name Dexter with Google searches for Bing. Probably if they have nothing to do with each other, this has a significance, a p-value that's less than 0.01. This is strongly statistically significant if you don't correct for the number of comparisons. Um, another one, let's see. We have a uh, number of articles Matt Levine published on Bloomberg versus nuclear power generation in France. Looks super correlated. Clearly, these have nothing to do with each other. Okay, again, a p-value less than 0.01. Um, this is maybe my favorite, American cheese consumption with BlackRock's stock price. Again, um, statistically significant if you don't correct for the number of comparisons. This one, you know, uh, is my favorite one. So spurious correlations, data dredging, phishing, comparing lots of variables is a common, uh, a common issue. You have to correct for the number of comparisons or the number of tests.
And I think that this website actually gives information about how they run this. Um, let's just go up, you know, um, let's see. At some point they're gonna say how many tests there are. Let's just see what it says. Um, well, if you go to this website, you'll, you'll, you know, um, you'll be able to figure out like some of these, there's, you know, this is correlation number 2,734. So clearly they have a big set of, of, uh, of variables that they can compare against each other. So there are thousands of comparisons that they're running to get these significant p-values. Okay. Um, yeah, the why this works um, would be kind of where you would look at it. So um, okay, so there are 25,000 variables in this database, which means that you have, you know, this enormous number of comparisons. So you're almost certain to find some subset of them with significant p-values, even though it's totally spurious and uncorrelated. Okay, good. Um, what I really wanted to show you is an example of this stopping data collection. This is a really cool example. And I was thinking about this when we were doing that website example. That's when this kind of came into my head as an example where I could show you um, a concrete example of, of p-hacking. And so um, this is actually a code I wrote in collaboration with uh, ChatGPT. It's pretty easy to do. Um, my original prompt was pretty simple. Uh, I said... I'd like to set up um, a Python script to demonstrate the danger associated with p-hacking. I want a code that generates random coin flips with a fair coin and then computes the p-value uh, for the hypothesis that the coin is fair or not. Okay, pretty simple. And then what I wanna do is I wanna start with an n equals 20 and I wanna keep flipping a coin until n equals 50. And for every single one of those extra coin flips from 20 to 50, I'm gonna compute the p-value and then plot the p-value, okay? Pretty simple idea. GPT got really, really close, um, but not perfect. Um, so I actually modified the code slightly to fix it. I'll tell you what it messed up um, maybe at the end of this, but I'll just show you the corrected code. It got really close. And later I asked it to correct the thing it messed up and it corrected it and wrote a really nice code. So what we're gonna do, um, we have essentially, I'm using a random seed of 41. You'll notice GPT always uses a random seed of 42. I asked it why, and of course it's because it's the answer to um, you know, the fundamental question uh, of the universe, right? Um, I changed to 41 for this case. And okay, we have an initial number of coin flips of 20. So I need at least 20 to make sense of computing a p-value. So I'm gonna start with 20 coin flips. And then I'm gonna go up to a max coin flip number of 50. So I'm gonna flip 20, then 21, 22, all the way up to 50. And from 20 to 50, we're gonna compute the p-value and we're gonna store that list of p-values and plot it. Really, really simple. Okay, um, so for the number of flips uh, in n values, so from uh, 20 to 50, each time we flip a new coin, a new flip, we append it to our list of coin flips, we uh, calculate how many heads there are, and we do a binomial test um, to see what the p-value is associated. We think that a fair coin is binomial with probability one half. And so we test, is that number of heads consistent with a binomial distribution? That's our hypothesis um, that we're testing. And we get a p-value. I'm glossing over a lot of this. You should write down a null hypothesis and confirm that this is correct. And we append that p-value for that coin flip to our list. And then we plot a bunch of stuff. So let's run this code. Okay, we run this code. And lo and behold, this is what we get. So this is the p-value versus the number of coin flips. So on my 21st coin flip, I have a p-value of, you know, 0.18. It fluctuates around. It's not significant, not significant, not significant. And then at some point around coin flip 33, because of just random chance, because I'm testing so many times, it dips below <laughs> significance. It turns out that just for this one time, if I only stopped at 33, my results would look significant, but for every other value of, of n, for you know, from 20 to 50 coin flips, I don't have a statistically significant result because my coin is in fact fair. This is a fair coin that we're flipping. And so I should be rejecting, I should be, you know, um, 
failing to reject my null hypothesis. My null hypothesis that the coin is fair is actually correct. And this shows you if I stop my data collection when I get the result I want, if I keep testing and testing and testing and testing, what I've essentially done is a bunch of uh, hypothesis tests, and I've kind of diluted the meaning of my p-value. I have to correct for that number of tests if that's what I'm going to do. And so designing your n ahead of time is super duper important. If I specified n equals 30 or 40 or 50 ahead of time, I would have gotten the right results. If I was unlucky and I specified n equals 33 ahead of time, I would have gotten the wrong result, and that's expected sometimes. That is what the p-value means. Sometimes you're going to get false positives uh, and false negatives. That's expected. But um, this way, you're much more likely to get the wrong result if you just wait until you get a significant p-value. Um, so this is kind of one example of a pitfall. I think it's kind of a nice example because it shows um, you know, a really common gut feeling way of doing this, which is just to collect data until you get a significant result. Totally cheating. You can't do that. Okay, um, so how did GPT mess it up the first time? Well, I wanted, obviously, a sequence of coin flips. So you flip 20, and then you flip a 21, the 21st coin, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th. But you keep the previous sequence fixed. The first time I asked GPT this prompt, it incorrectly created a sequence of 20 flips, and then a brand new sequence of 21 flips, and then a brand new sequence of 22 flips, which isn't what I asked for. Um, it gives this kind of nonsensical you know, uh, p-value where every single uh, experiment was a completely different sequence of coins. Um, the good news is it's really easy to, to fix if you know what you're looking for. So this is my you know, uh, corrected code. I asked and I said, you, this is close, GPT, but I want to start with 20 coin flips. And then each time I add a coin flip, it's an addition to the previous coins already flipped. So the first 20 never change. And every time I add a new coin flip to the sequence, I compute the p-value. With that modification, it fixed the code, totally nailed it, and gave uh, the example I was looking for. Okay, so really easy to code this stuff up. Um, make sure you know what you're looking for, though, and you can double check the answers because it did get it wrong the first time. But it gave me a base code that I could pretty easily modify myself, or I could ask it to modify it based on my, correct, my corrected feedback. Um, and if you change the random seed, this will change. So if you use 42, um, you'll actually get a case where, I guess, the first sequence was so nicely conforming to you know, random chance that it never dips below significance. But if I change the p-value, yeah, sorry, my random seed to a different random number, like 41 or 40 or 39, sometimes I'll get this spurious effect. So try this for different random seeds, 39, 38, 37, whatever. And a really interesting question, this is something that I um, was thinking about myself, is if I started with an n of 20, and I keep increasing until I stop, until I get the, the result I'm looking for, how likely am I, how, how does that modify my, my p-value? How does that dilute my p-value? Or said another way, how likely am I to get the wrong results um, if I do this kind of, this version of p-hacking? How bad is this? Can you quantify how bad of an idea or how bad this messes up your statistics? That's a pretty interesting and hard problem that I would like you to think about. Okay, pitfalls. Uh, P-hacking. Know what you're doing. You get one comparison. You have to design your experiment ahead of time, including the number of samples, including everything. Ideally, you would publish that uh, protocol or give it to somebody so that they can keep you honest. And then you do that one test and you report your results. If you're going to be doing lots of tests, because that's you know, you have a big, rich data set and you want to do lots of tests, that is okay, but you have to correct for the number of tests that you do. That changes. Uh, it, you have to normalize your p-value. It changes what significance means if you're going to run lots of tests. Okay, thank you.